morning, you wonderful people. It's great to see you today. No, you cannot have my orange. I need that. I'm going to eat it after the last service, but till then, I need it. It's great to see you today. I shall begin by doing what I didn't do at the last service. I just pushed the timer, okay? So it will go off at 2 o'clock this afternoon. Go home, take a nap, eat some barbecue. The Niners will be on devastating the Green Bay Packers at 5 o'clock. I want to tell you, um, I just, I love Ray and Erica, and they love God, they love you, and like Carrie and I, they love the Bay Area. This is our forever call for the rest of our lives. People can move to Idaho and Texas and Florida and all the Arizona, those are wonderful places. California's home. And this is our mission, the eight million beautiful souls of the Bay Area. And it is a privilege to be with you wonderful people today. So whether you're a veteran or the Bay Church is new to you, listen, you just be you, okay? We don't have some kind of preconceived here. We're just all real people uh, trying to understand what it means to, to fully follow God. So having said that, I want to tell you also, I will be here next weekend, not teaching, but giving you an upgrade update. So we're going to upgrade the physical campus. It'll take us, we're guessing, in the 12 to 18 month range. A lot of it depends on how quick the city of Brentwood is or isn't because we'll have to get permission on a number of projects. But I will give you that update next weekend. Excited to tell you what we've got coming over the next year at this church campus. And then I want to say, please access notes every weekend. We go to great Uh, effort to make sure that you are fully threaded into our Bible study. So on your device, just load the Bay Church app. It's free. It's blue with a white B in it. And you'll see Concord and Brentwood campuses. Tap on Brentwood right now. And then tap on message notes and just everything will be right there for you, okay? Because we just can't cover everything um, that is in this biblical passage for today. So, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And that's our theme today. Now, we are going to start next weekend diving deep into the text itself. Chapter 1, verse 1 of the book of Genesis. This week is kind of an orientation. This week we're understanding how to understand Genesis. This week we're saying what lens are we going to use to understand the Word of God because we believe as your servant leaders and as your teaching team that you cannot fully mature in your relationship with Christ if you don't don't get a really good grip on this all-important first book of the Bible. Genesis is incredibly important to your spiritual well-being. Everything that we do in life and everything that we know and understand, it all originates in the first book of God's Word. So, that being said, what we're going to do, we're calling the series When God Fell in Love, that's the title of the whole Genesis series now, it's 50 chapters. We are going to journey together for 40 weekends from now through June. And I want to tell you some other things that will further thread you in, so open up your heart, open up your eyes. We are going to divide the 40 weekends, kind of like an online or, you know, a streaming Netflix, Amazon, whatever, kind of a streaming TV series of five seasons. And here's what they look like. Season one, we are calling Blueprint for our blue dot. And that's chapters one and two. Season number two will be then everything went wrong. And those will be Genesis chapters three through 11. Season three is gonna be Abraham, Adam 3.0. That's chapters 12 to 24. And then Jacob, Odyssey of a Trickster, chapters 25 to 36, is season number four. And then we'll wrap with season number five, Joseph and a Band of Brothers to Save the World, chapters 37 to 50. That's how we'll be dividing this beautiful first book of the Bible into five seasons. You say, well, John, what can I do to get ready? Okay, I'm a simple man. Read 
the Bible. <laughs> On your own, read Genesis. You say, John, I've read it before. I know, so have I. Probably, literally, 75 times. Read it again. In other words, I don't want you bumping into truth for the first time when we're working through a chapter or a passage on weekends. So I want you to say, cool, I read that this week, so I have an orientation, and it will. you're just going to grow so much further. So in your daily time with God, which we say daily Bible reading is the most essential spiritual habit of all, because here's why. You have to learn, I have to learn how to spiritually self-feed. That's what devotions are. So we're going to work our head off as your pastors to biblically feed you well, nourish you well spiritually on the weekends. But who's going to feed you all on Monday? Who's going to feed you all on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday? So if you compared Bible teaching to a meal, who only wants to eat one time a week? I like to eat at least two or three times a day. And honestly, I like to eat every day. I bet you are in the same position. So if you're not spiritually self-feeding, spending time every day in God's word, watch this. You're causing spiritual starvation to the spiritual side of your life. So begin with Genesis. It is scintillating and thrilling and awesome. And begin it and you'll be changed. Now, if you will give us these 40 weekends, here's what I think we can say to you as your servant leaders that we'll give you. We will give you a transformed way of understanding and seeing your world. We'll give you a transformed faith in your relationship with God. We'll give you a transformed understanding of how you see and understand the ultimate issues in life. But you've got to put in the time. I'm not talking about a lot of time. 15, 20 minutes a day, 30 to 45 at the outside, but 15 to 20 minutes a day. How much time do we waste on meaningless cell phone calls 15 times a day with little windows of time like that? So let me take it a step further. Not only are we going to study Genesis on the weekends, we are going to study Genesis during the week, and it starts Tuesday night. So here's what we're doing. We can't possibly take the time to teach everything we need to teach on a Sunday morning. You would not appreciate that. You would like it in theory, but if I told you take us two to three hours to do that, you'd say, I'm out of here, okay? So we're trying to do a good life application teachings on the weekends in Genesis, but then on Tuesday nights, we're starting a whole new ministry of the Bay Church called Deeper, going deeper in Genesis. Now, here's how we're gonna do it. It starts this Tuesday night, two days from now. It'll be on the Concord campus from 6.30 to 8 o'clock every Tuesday night. By the way, I walked in and my assistant just said to me, hey, pastor, we've already got 60 people signed up, registered for the class Tuesday. Okay, so when you register, you can do one of two things. You can say, John, I'm going to go. I'm going to sit in because there'll be Q&A, there'll be live teaching, there's going to be a lot of interaction, it'll be a great group, or we, you can Zoom because we are Zooming it. So all you would need to do, because your schedule disallows or whatever and you want to Zoom it, all you need to do is go to our church website, the Bay.Church, and then register for the deeper class and a Zoom link will be sent to you. So that when Tuesday night comes and you're ready to go, all you need to do is click on and boom, you'll be there, okay? So it's Tuesday night live, 6.30 to 8.30. If you cannot be there physically, you can Zoom it. Uh, but beyond that, we've also learned how to create a podcast for the Bay Church. So this Bay Church podcast will be uh, a reworking of those that just want an experience on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, etc. That will be available a little bit later in the week, okay? Now, there's more. If you want to access a lot of the materials that we're using as your pastors to teach Genesis, go on our website again, the Bay.Church, and you'll see a resources area, kind of a Bible study corner, and everything is listed there for you, for your convenience, because we want you to grow as much as you want to grow. But there's more. What we've noticed is when families, for example, come to church, they get out of the car, mom and dad go this way, grandma and grandpa go that way, and the kids go this way. 
and they're, they're not connecting, they're usually not studying the same part of the Bible. We want whole families to study Genesis together when God fell in love. And so what we're doing, we're going to run the children's and student curriculum a couple weeks behind the adults. So your kids come home and say, yo mom, yo dad, what about that Noah's Ark thing? Is that like a real thing, dude, or is that like just a fantasy? And you can say, son, that's a good question. Sit down. Let's talk about Noah's big boat. Because you've had the chance on weekends and in deeper to understand these things you may have been wondering about most of your Christian life. Okay, so we want to do faith and Bible study as a whole family. You say, John, why do we go to this much trouble to teach the Bible? Because it's who God has called us to be. We've taught you the 13 core values of the Bay Church. Number one is this. We will always be biblically centered. This church is not run around a personality, around a denomination, around one extreme doctrine. It is based in the whole of Holy Scripture and on the sure foundation that is Jesus Christ our Lord. And so we are going to be a biblically centered faith community. So there is the strategy, there's the game plan, and it begins this week as we go deeper in Genesis. Okay. So let's begin. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And I want you to think with me for just a moment uh, about our position, yours and mine, seated right here in the worship center on a Sunday morning. I want us to think about our position in the universe, okay? So this thing, imagine this is the sun. And you understand the size of the sun relative to how much bigger it is than the earth. If this was the sun, the earth, in other words, home sweet home for us, right, is about where the front doors of the church are. Not the doors into the worship center, the front doors of the church. That's the distance, okay? Now, if you zoom out a bit and you're getting further and further away, you're beginning to realize, though the sun is so much larger than the earth, you're beginning to realize that in a universal perspective, the sun's actually pretty small itself. So the sun appears small in its cosmic environment. So I want you to think of the galaxies around us as a huge orange tree, maybe something like this. Check it out. And all of those represent separate galaxies. And watch this. There are not hundreds of those. There are not thousands. There are, with a B, billions of them. So how much is it changing now in our understanding when we read those 10 words, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth? Is your notion of what that creation includes expanding even as we speak? Now, let's look at home sweet home. This is the Milky Way. Okay, this is what we call home. This is the part of the vast universe that we occupy. But friends, our Milky Way itself is in itself one tiny galaxy in a much wider universe. So it's not an orange tree, a galaxy among galaxies, but maybe it's like this. These are all orange trees in vast orange groves, okay? Just again, trying to give you a sense of the magnificence. So our galaxy, we know, is just one of 125 billion galaxies in the universe. So there are more galaxies in the universe, hello, than there are stars in a typical galaxy. Think about the magnificence Now of the statement that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, the Hubble Extreme Deep Field Telescope, all these dots, those are actually galaxies. And remember, the Hubble can only capture the tiniest of slices of the vastness of the universe. Now, let me blow you away still further. Some of you are saying, dude, you're freaking me out. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, we're getting going, baby. So we know, or maybe it would be better to say we don't know, and frankly, as human beings, uh, we cannot know that actually 95% of our universe is undeterminable, and the uh, scientists call it dark energy, 
or dark matter. But if there was not that dark energy or dark matter, and you can see it there on that pie chart, uh, the whole universe would fall apart. Now, I'm not a scientist. I am a simple pastor. I am a shepherd of souls. But what I've just explained to you in brief is mind-boggling complexity and beauty. And that notwithstanding, what about our human brains that are even able to grasp the words that I'm saying to you right now? There is a very significant line of demarcation between a part of the population of our planet that says all of this vastness. Go ahead and put up the previous picture again, would you please? There is a part of the citizens of this tiny little planet we occupy that would say all of that got here by chance. I want to suggest to you kind of a radical, extreme alternative because I think there's a better explanation and that is all of this got here at the hands of a holy creative God when he spoke it into existence. Let there be light and there was light. And so what we are seeing when we're seeing the universe is a sliver of his infinite genius and creative glory. It's a window into his eternally creative love. And here's the deal. This vast and glorious universe is created by a God who is even more unspeakably vast and infinitely more glorious. He is the God of the universe the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the Creator God. Now, let's go from zooming way out and let's go back in. In 1990, NASA had a space probe called Voyager 1. Maybe you remember it, maybe you don't. A lot of y'all were born after or, you know, shortly after 1990 and you're not familiar with it, whatever. Just as Voyager 1 was about to leave our tiny solar system, meaning it was 4 billion miles away from Earth, NASA commanded it to turn and take a departing picture of planet Earth, and this is it. You and I are here. Now, Carl Sagan, keep that picture up, please, Nathan, if you would, uh, put it this way. He said, look again at that dot. That's here. That's home. That's us. And he concluded his comments by saying, to me, he said, it's like a moat of dust suspended in a sunbeam. But that's not what the Bible says it is. I'm going to give you a spiritual principle that will really help you. And, and remember, the Bible says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind and all your strength. God gave us brains, magnificent brains, and all the ability to process data and memory and uh, imagination, etc., etc. But we are to love God with our minds. The thing we must remember is we don't have to see to believe. We have to believe and then we will see. There is a spiritual dimension which modern man, because it's not empirical, it can't be put into laboratory conditions under repeatable circumstance, having the same sort of chemical outcomes, and therefore mankind doesn't deal well uh, in the realm of uh, believing in anything which is not empirically provable. But see, science is always asking how something happens. Faith is about why something happens. More on that in just a few moments. King David was way ahead of the Carl Sagans of our era. When in Psalm chapter 8, David put it this way. He said, when I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him? And oh God, the son of man that you care for him. That's exactly what the biblical authors are saying. And this King David in Psalm chapter 8. Now, I want to suggest to you then, what we live on, go ahead and go back to the picture of you are here if you would. 
I want you to know that we are not just a pale blue dot. We are certainly not a moat of dust suspended in a sunbeam. We are God's beloved blue dot, a beautiful world, a good world that God has made, that God loves, and that he longs to redeem. You say, John, how do you know that God loves it? The Bible tells us maybe the most uh, well-known verse out of the whole of the Bible, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. And so friends, God had an original blueprint for our blue dot before we marred it with sin. But in his original blueprint for his blue dot, there was goodness and there was beauty. Uh, We learned everything we needed to know about life and work and sex and animals and stars and food, et cetera, et cetera. Now, how many of y'all like Thanksgiving? I'm a holiday freak. Right now with football going on, the holidays are happening, the leaves are changing, church is starting back up, this is a great time to be alive. So when you have a Thanksgiving feast, what have you got to do? You've got to prepare the banquet table. You've got to get the table set and ready for the feast. That's what we're going to do with the balance of our time this morning. In the next 15, 20 minutes or so, I want to give you the framework that let's call five big ideas that will help us understand how we need to understand Genesis. They're all in your notes on your device. I hope you're accessing this and then using these notes for additional Bible study during the week, okay? So number one, the first big idea is that the Word of God is both timely and timeless, Timely and timeless. Now, let me give you a working principle that is critically important to correctly understanding the Bible, and it's this. The Bible is written for us, inspired by God through human instrumentation, and it is inspired and written for us. But watch this. In its original inspiration, it was not written to us. Because I'm pretty confident that not one of you in the room today, certainly not myself, was alive three to 4,000 years ago. And I don't believe in reincarnation, no offense, just don't believe in that. So the Bible in its original inspiration was inspired by God through human instrumentation. In this place, uh, Moses. Moses was the individual God used for the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. So God used Moses to be the human uh, tool through whom he inspired his holy word, but it was written for, to the first audience three to 4,000 years ago. And people and human culture and values and life and circumstances, everything was different then. Truth hasn't changed. Human civilizations have changed. So we need to understand it in its original context of inspiration. In other words, the Bible can never mean what the Bible never meant. We have to understand what it meant to the first hearers in their context. Okay, let me give you an example. I don't know why this is popping to mind, but I I say this because as a student of church history, I can't tell you how much I've seen through church history uh, improper understanding of the Bible where angry people rip Scripture out of context, having nothing to do with its intent, and then they force it on other human beings and in some sense imprison other people. So, for example, I can't tell you how many people I've had say to me over the decades in ministry, uh, John, women can't be in ministry, women can't wear pants, they can't wear makeup, they can't speak in church, they can't I'm saying like, really, so you mean the Ephesians thing when Paul was talking about, I do not permit a woman. Paul was speaking about, inspired of the Holy Spirit, addressing one given situation in one church at one moment in time in the unique cultural environment of ancient Ephesus, which no longer exists because it was destroyed in an earthquake about 600 A.D., So it was for that church at that time. What the Bible does teach about women in ministry or men and women together is that we are both equally 
created in the image of God, and we are equal. He created us in his image, male and female, and women have every prerogative in the work of the Lord to serve in any capacity uh, with great effectiveness and great kingdom outcomes. And I'm looking at one of our dynamic missionaries here. But in many contexts, I've been in churches where they rip it out of context when God intended it for something entirely different. So, thenness before nowness, the Bible can never mean what the Bible never meant. That's what I mean by timely. You say, well, John, what do we mean by timeless? It means... Once properly understood contextually, the Bible is God's word for us today. It transcends culture. It is the living, active word of God, sharper than any double-edged sword. And it can and does have something to say to us in the autumn of the year of our Lord, 2021. The Bible is timely. The Bible is timeless. That's the first big idea. Number two, second big idea is the major themes of Genesis you and I will discover again and again and again and again are going to be creation and covenant. Now, the idea of creation we're more familiar with, so let me explain just a couple things about the idea of covenant. You say, John, what is a covenant? Well, it originated uh, in the biblical world at a time in which the scholars called the ancient Near East, just think today's Middle East, okay, the Middle East. Israel and all the Palestinian and Arab countries huddled there on the eastern side of the great Mediterranean, okay? That's where covenant originated, and it was a standard political arrangement between two kings in days of antiquity. One was a greater king, and one was a lesser king. And you can see the analogy, God is our great king. And we are not gods at all, nor are we kings. We are his creation created in his image. And he has a covenant relationship with us. So God, the king of the whole universe, makes a covenant at first with humanity, then later a particular family to care for and rule the world that God has made. So covenant and kingdom, what we run into, if covenant is more this idea in the Old Testament, Jesus so often taught covenant, but he explained it more in terms of kingdom or the kingdom of God. So covenant and kingdom are two sides of the same coin. Remember that. So we could say this is what Genesis is ultimately all about writes one, Genesis is all about what happens when an unstoppable force meets an immovable object. An unstoppable force being God's desire to bless the world, the immovable object being humanity's determination to rebel. All the trees in the garden I've given of you to eat and for your enjoyment and nourishment, but of this one tree, Please don't eat of that because in the day that you eat of that, my child, you will die. And that's the immovable object, but I want you to know the unstoppable force of God's redeeming love is not put off by any transigence in the human heart. So covenant is the God-ordained pathway back to new creation. It is our pathway back home, friends. Number three, Genesis and science. Genesis and science, God's word and God's work are in harmony. Now, I'm seeing a number of students here. We had some last service as well. Uh, mothers, fathers, grandparents, older people. I number myself uh, among those, not old, older. You understand that the a priori assumption, the foundational assumption in all of American academia is of a closed self-causation universe in which the idea of a god or gods is ridiculous and preposterous, uh, primarily because it's not empirical, which is to say it cannot be proven through scientific means or in a controllable laboratory scientific context. Therefore, because it cannot be scientifically approved, uh, verified, it does not exist. You know that your sons and daughters 
and your grandchildren are being taught this. And so when we say, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, don't be afraid. Uh, but begin to expand your understanding so you can have meaningful conversations in your home and with those you love. Do you know when kids bolt the church and bolt their faith and bolt the God, the faith of the God of their fathers and mothers? When parents angrily say, we don't talk about that. This is the way it is. Hush up and believe. That doesn't work. Allow your child's mind to question, to wonder, to have doubts. Doubts are a normal part of being a human being. You can't show me a great woman or man of God in the Bible that didn't have serious seasons of doubt, of falling away from God, even of unapologetic sin. You know, other than Jesus, David uh, is my hero in the Bible. And David is a mess. He, he's a mess, dude. If you put David through psychoanalysis, you get cuckoo, dude. Because I'm telling you, he had some moments, you know, when you're salivating on your beard and spitting and feigning insanity to not be arrested, that ain't normal. Okay, so all the individuals of, of the Bible were very human, human beings. So, God and science. Let me give you a good... Do you guys like cartoons? I love Family Circus. So this is Family Circus. Um, and this is, I don't know, Billy, Jeffy, Sammy. No, Sam's the dog. One of them. Asking the mother a question. They're at the Grand Canyon. This is where my wife and I went this year. I'm really glad they have those screens up, man, because it's a long fall. And the sudden stop is a serious bummer. But he's asking his mother, Mommy... The ranger said the river dug the canyon, but mom, you said God did it. Who's right? Do you understand how real that is to everyday life? Kids want to know, and by the way, they have a right to know. A faith untested is no faith at all. And so allow your children to explore the wonders of Holy Scripture and of the world that God created and know that our children are not, we own them, they're only on loan. Not I own, only on loan. And so we trust the Lord ultimately with our children. So, did the river dig the canyon or did God? Leave that picture up for just a moment, would, would you please? I want to give you a thought maybe you've never thought before. Here it is. Very possibly both. Both the river and God. Let me tell you what I mean by that. When we begin to study verse by verse Genesis chapter 1 next week, you know what we're going to discover in terms of how God, in the, in the um, uh, inspired record, how God creates in Genesis 1? He speaks it, and boom, it exists. Let there be light. Boom. A greater light to rule the day, a lesser light to rule the night. And let there be dry land separated from the waters. Boom, boom. He speaks it into existence. Theologically, we call that obviously immediate creation. It's spoken by the words of Almighty God. But in Genesis 2, God continues his creative genius, but he actually does it differently because when he comes to human beings, he doesn't say, let there be man, let there be woman. He reaches down and he puts his hands in the dirt, watch this, and he takes existing created material, dirt, to create something new, a living human being created in his image. We call this mediate creation. In other words, there's a medium through which God in chapter 2 is choosing to create. In this case, the medium is dust. So folks, not to hurt your feelings, but when you're asked today when you go home for lunch, what'd you learn in church today? I learned I'm nothing more than organized dust. Because that's really what we human beings are. In our mortal frailty, our actual human bodies, we are organized dust. So ask yourself the question, why could God not create the Grand Canyon through immediate creation, and in this case, his tool is the water of the river. Could, could not be, because we see both in Genesis 1 and in Genesis 2, so ultimately, it doesn't matter. The river might be God's chisel, it might be God's paintbrush. So let me ask you this question. Do you have any favorite artists that are painters? I used to love Thomas Kincaid some years ago, and here's the question. If an artist 
uses a paintbrush to paint a picture. Do we credit the painting to the paintbrush or do we credit the genius of the painting to the artist who held the paintbrush in his or her hand? Of course, we credit the artist as the one who created the creative masterpiece. And God's an artist. He is a divine artist. And evidently, according to the biblical record, he chooses to use tools. His choice, not ours. Now, we live in a world today that is an empirical world. That is, because we live in a closed self causation universe that means there is no god and so in a sense we have deified ourselves think about that question in terms of humanism everybody has a god the only question is which god do you serve and so there's an individual here <laughs> his name's jared olson bless his little pink heart he is a person who travels and speaks eloquently against the god that he says does not exist and the article is entitled, What Has God Ever Done For Me? Asks Man Breathing Air. <laughs> Jared Olson calls into question the absurd idea that God has ever done anything for him, all the while inhaling oxygen and exhaling carbon dioxide in a complex process well beyond his mind's capability of understanding it in its entirety. The idea of God, he preaches, is really just holding us back. And while he says that, the membrane across his larynx vibrates to modulate the flow of air from his lungs, and they are perceived by intricate ear structures which transform invisible sound waves into abstract thought in their brain's nervous tissue. There's just absolutely no evidence of God, says Jared. All the while, the surface of his feet are resting on a surface which continues to spin around the earth's core without any input from Jared Olson at all, all while the known habitats on this planet on which he stands rocket around the center of the galaxy in perfect formation at the unfathomable rate of speed of 490,000 miles per hour. And his audience looks at him with their eyes, which are hundreds of millions of cone cells and rod cells responding to billions of stimuli in an unimaginably sophisticated procedure at an unbelievable volume of input per second. And he asks, what has God ever done for me? The last speech he gave, by the way, when the reporter wrote this article, he was actually speaking in a public building that on one side had a Christian homeless shelter and on the other side had a Catholic hospital. I say again, you don't have to see to believe. You have to believe to see. The evidence is overwhelming. Science is asking, and I love science, and I honor the discipline of science, and I would add the limited discipline of science, but science says there is no spiritual reality, there is no spiritual world, and science would not purport to be speaking the spiritual truth. Science is asking the question, how? The Bible is not asking the question, how? The Bible is not essentially, not essentially, not essentially a science book. This is not a science text. It is a spiritual text. It is our playbook for living. It's the owner's manual from a holy creator God. The Bible's not so concerned with how. The Bible is concerned with why. Remember, science wants to know how. The Bible wants to know why. But then you have genius, spirit-filled, godly scientists like Francis Collins who said this. He said, I can worship God in a laboratory or I can worship God in a cathedral. Amen. Somebody else said, faith is not trusting against the facts. 
It's trusting beyond the facts. Okay, number four, fourth big idea. Where we come from tells us who we are. So who we are, friends, rightly understood, is tied to who God is, imago Dei, because we are created in His image. So the fundamental question is, who is God? Not to disappoint anybody, but in our American culture today, which is obsessed with self-exploration and self discovery in which it's all about me, my identity, my passions, my flourishing. I agree with Rick Warren, who in his epic book, The Purpose Driven Life, the first words of the book were, it's not about you. So when we come to Genesis, remember this one thing. Uh, The primary or main character is not Adam. It is not Eve. It's not Noah. It's not Abraham. It's not Sarah. Not Jacob or Joseph. And it's certainly not you or me. The main character of Genesis is God. Remember that. We're going to learn much about the heart of our Creator God. Much about Father God in this journey together who made something magnificent out of nothing. He created beauty out of ashes, order, and life out of chaos and death. And here's my inspiring hope for you, I think. What God created with new magnificent wonder in the natural universe, He can create inside you and inside me. He can create something new in us and for our lives. In this book of beginnings, God is wanting us to have a new spiritual beginning ourselves so open up wide your heart the bible says if anyone is in christ they are a new creation the old is gone and the new has come number five as we wrap the fifth big idea genesis is when god fell in love you say john prove it okay maybe the most famous verse in all of the world today relative to the bible uh uh, john 3 16 please I want everybody to read this in a big, loud voice. Now, I let the 9 o'clock crowd limp through because they only had two cups of coffee and it was still before 10 in the morning. But y'all bring it, okay? Are you ready? Let's read together. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. And everyone said... For God so loved the world. Not in a sense that God's wildly in love with trees and ferns and bull elk, although he certainly rejoices in his creative genius. But God loves you and I. Yes, he loves his created universe as it were, but he loves you and I so much that he put on skin and became us. Jesus is fully God, fully man. Jesus said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father because I and the Father are one. And so Genesis is when God fell in love. Now, if Genesis is the first book of the Bible when God creates the world, the universe, heaven, and so forth. Let's go to the very last chapter of the Bible. I will read it to you. It's in Revelation 21, 1 to 4. Now we're 66 books later. We're at the end of the last book of the Bible. Look what happens, and I want you to notice one special word, N-E-W, new. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, the ones we'll be reading about and discovering in Genesis chapter 1, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things will have passed away. 
in one of the early weekend teachings in the first series, remember we're in five books in Genesis, we're going to call it a temple-shaped world because ultimately God wants to dwell on the throne of our lives internally. Paul said this, he said in the New Testament, don't you know that you're God's temple and God's spirit lives inside of you? So our lives should become temple-shaped lives. We'll talk more about this in weekends going forward. Last picture I want you to see, friends, the Pantocrator. You say, John, what in the world is that? That is a word which simply means ruler of all. What you and I are looking at is an actual rendering of what Christian artists for the last couple thousand years have painted like Michelangelo on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. That's not there, but that idea of laying on your back on kind of a very tall, what's the thing when you're scaffolding? Very t- Thank you. My brain's tired and I got a cold. Very tall scaffolding. And this is what they would paint because here in this Pantocrator, what we're seeing is Jesus as the cosmic Lord over all the cosmos. And it's been painted inside of churches, Christian churches, Christian cathedrals, uh, throughout Christian history to remind us He is Lord and ruler of all. And friends, thus begins our journey, Genesis, when God fell in love. Would you stand to your feet, please? I want us to uh, pray together. It it would be my privilege to pray for you beautiful people. I want to say several things, and I think I'm needing Neto or or maybe even Mario or Nathan. Um, Where's our connect area here on the Brentwood campus? Is there a specific place? Is it in the front of the building? Okay. (coughs) Pardon me. Again, I do not have COVID. I had a test this week. I have had a bad cold, but the doctor said you've had it for a week. You can go ahead and go to church. So I'm going to just have to air hug you today because really what I'd love to do is give you a big old bear hug. If you need to have a conversation about where you're at in your life and, and your spiritual sort of awakening and questions, we have a connect area that you can stop outside and we have non-judgmental, no strings attached people available to sit and talk, pray, listen, whatever's on your heart, we are here to serve you. Secondly, don't forget Kevin and Asunda, this is their last weekend with us. Uh, They will be uh, back here in the fellowship hall. We got cupcakes and so for a time of fellowship to give them a hug and let them know of your appreciation. Also, growth track, if you've not taken growth track, take growth track It's a game changer, and it'll begin to get your life on a forward growth progression. And then finally, deeper. This Tuesday night, and I want to remind you, all you need to go, if you're going to Zoom, is go to the bay.church, you register online for the class, and then a Zoom link will be sent to you. So you can join by Zoom. It's every Tuesday night beginning this week, 6.30 to 8 o'clock at the Concord campus. Please come one, come all. We'd love to have you there. It's going to be a great time of learning, going deep in Holy Scripture in the book of Genesis, questions, answers, etc., and then followed a couple days later by a podcast, okay? So let's pray. Father God, I pray that you let us love your word. In fact, the psalmist and others say that we would love your word more than our necessary bread because truly your word, O God, is food for our soul. At the same time, God, we want to love you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. So without fear, but rather with childlike faith, not childish, but childlike faith, may we begin this sojourn together through the book of Genesis. And may your word come alive as it's never come alive in each of our hearts. Never come alive before. May that happen now as we begin to each personally read Genesis 
as we learn and grow together week by week in Sunday sermons, in Tuesday night deeper, and in our everyday devotional time, let the first holy book of your holy word come alive for us and seize us. And God, may we walk out of this series months down the road different than we entered because we've hidden your word in our heart. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, I love you so much, friends. Go with God.